Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the street. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the street. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, shout Jesus from the mountains. Shout Jesus from the mountains. And Jesus in the streets. Jesus in Jesus, Jesus, over every heart and every mind. As I know there is peace within your presence, I speak Jesus. I speak Jesus, Jesus. Say Jesus, just say his name, Jesus. We speak it over everything. There's power in his name. There's power in the name of Jesus. Jesus, there's power in your name. There's power in your name, Lord. Jesus. Jesus, there's none like you, Lord. There's none like you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Jesus. Is that extra? Jesus. Do you have one? It's all about you, Jesus. Shut that up. Have your way, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Give your praise, oh God. Jesus, 
Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus,
at the name Jesus. Jesus at the name Jesus. At the name Jesus. Bible says um, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess how many know that's true today that's true tomorrow that will be true forevermore how many know he is the King of Kings he is the Lord most high there's none greater there's none more powerful and there's none that has the keys of the kingdom but Jesus. How I many know it's in his hands? Amen. We're going to have some prayer in a moment. And uh, you know, God is the God of the impossible. And he calls us to be in faith concerning that. How many know we're to be in faith concerning that confession? Amen. And yet the Lord is very practical in what he calls us to do in light of that. Amen? I mean, he's pretty practical. Can you say God is practical? Do you know that God created the air that you breathe before he created you to breathe it? How many know he's pretty practical? <laughs> Some of you are breathing some air, and you should be more thankful to God that he did that. <laughs> so if we just, um, this past week, of course, in our prayer and fasting, we confessed as what we believed, that God has closed up the gates of hell. Amen. From our lives, we pray that way. We pray, God, close up the gates of hell. Jesus said, I'll build my church. And what would happen? God has said, I've closed up the gates of hell on your behalf. Now, that's not to say that the gates of hell will not try to prevail against you, but you need to speak back to it. Amen. Come on, you need to speak back to it. Jesus said, you speak to the mountains. Sometimes I think God takes more faith to believe that you can move us than you can move a mountain because we need to get moving with what God is about to do on earth. But you know what? He's closed up the gates of hell, but he's opened up the gates of heaven. I said he's opened up the gates of heaven. He said, I've opened up the gates of heaven, all the windows, all the doors. And so our confession over you this week it's what the, we as the pastorals, the elders of the church, we, we pray that over you this week. So now you be in agreement with us because we want the full measure of that prayer to fall upon you and your household. Amen. He said, I'm closing off the gates of hell from hindering you, but I'm opening up the gates of heaven to bless you, to increase you. To give you everything that you need, everything Jesus has already provided, it is yours. Amen in Amen. Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. Receive it. Anyway, let me, let me just get to this now. Very practical part of our faith. We've been praying this week again. We've been praying, God, bring in the lost. Amen at any cost. We play a part in that, of course. But God is bringing home his sons and daughters. He's calling them from afar. I hope you can echo that with us this week. Continue to echo it. From the north, the south, the east, and the west, we call them home. Jesus is, Jesus is calling his children home for a great ingathering before his return. Here's the practical part of that. We just, um, we just came through a season of December, where in this culture we celebrate the birth of Christ. 
the scripture and the, and, and the storyline goes that when Mary and Joseph came to Bethlehem, they found no room in the inn. You remember that? Well, God forbid that when he brings the sons and daughters from afar, that he doesn't come to a house where there's no room for them. How many know God is practical? He is practical and he is powerful. God will do what he will do, but here's what he wants you and I to do. He wants you and I to begin to believe as a congregation for the place, not just for where we are today, but where we will be tomorrow according to the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Faith calls those things that are not as though they are. We need a house that will house the people that will come in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. We used to say this um, probably in, in this church, but I know in a church that we were out west, we'd always look around, and if there was an empty chair beside us, we would speak to that chair. And we would tell that chair to get ready. There's somebody coming that's going to be sitting there. Amen. We need to believe as we look forward in faith for a house that will be prepared for the coming of your sons and daughters. Amen. His children. Amen. I want you to join with, um, with Tim as he comes. Tim's one of our elders. And I just want you to agree with him. I want you to pry in faith with him as we believe for a house that will house these folk and glorify the presence of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I just want to give you a quick reminder. Um, everyone remember the walls of Jericho? Remember the story when Jericho fell? You remember that? Mm-hmm. Yes? yes? Everyone remembers do. when Jericho fell? Before the walls fell, on this side of the walls, God made a promise to the children. Everywhere your foot treads upon. Everywhere. And they looked at that wall and they said, how is this possible? How is this wall going to fall? How are we going to be able to take that land? On this side. Now inside of the wall, God is already at work. (laughs) He's already at work. He's already at work. He's confusing what's the devil and what's going on and he doesn't doesn't know what's happening so now the people that are inside the land that's on the inside they're afraid of the people that are on the outside they don't know what's happening (laughs) well I'm telling you that we are on the outside God is at work on the inside you may not know where God is what God is doing and how he's doing it when he's going to do it but he made a promise to us that if we walk by faith if we trust him and put our faith and our confidence in him that he would do what he can do Our job on this side is to walk around the walls and to pray and to pray and to pray and to walk around the walls and believe God for bigger and greater things. However, when we get to the other side, which you will experience, I just want you to know that. How do I know that? Because I've been there multiple times. And when we get to the other side where we're going, there will be something that's going to happen within you. There's going to be a a passion, a faith that will rise up inside of you. And you're going to say, well, now what can I do? What can I do? Because we're all going to be so excited and say, well, oh my gosh, look, God really did this. He really can do this stuff. I'm telling you, he can do it. So I'm just going to pray. I want you to believe with me because we believe where we're going. We've never been there before. All I have is my experiences. Uh, we're believing for God for, for bigger and greater things. Now, all of this stuff that we're believing God for, by faith, God can do what God can do. But you need to do what you can do. Right. You need to put your hand to the plow, and you need to begin to trust God, not just for you and your household, but for an abundance for an abundance that your cup overflows that you can give into into people's lives and begin to be a blessing be a a channel in the kingdom of God and then watch and see what God will do then watch and see so Father God we just come before you this morning looking at the the walls and see how are you going to do it Lord 
How is this possible? But by faith, by faith, by faith, it's by faith, God will do the impossible. So we just come before you this morning, Lord, putting our heart, joining our hearts together as one voice, expecting, oh God, to see a miracle, a miracle that we would experience, Father, not just as an individual, but as a body as we join our hearts together, expecting for greater and better things, that there would be no, no obstacles that would come in our way, that the path before us, yes, would be maybe with some uh, pressures from life, but they would not be a hindrance. They would not re take our focus off what you said, but we would keep our eyes on Jesus. So we honor you, Father, in this place. We honor you. We praise you. We worship you. We worship you. Hallelujah. You know, when we sang the, the, these are the days of Elijah, God wants to pour out his anointing on you so that you are experiencing the days of Elijah in your life. He doesn't want you walking with pain and shame and hurt and disappointments and lack he wants you blessed he wants to prosper you he wants you to be in health even as your soul prospers there's a there's a group of people that are about to come back and this is the key holy spirit is doing it we just need to be ready so make sure you're ready bow your knee and ask jesus for help help me lord to be more like you. Help me to love the unlovable. Help me, Lord. Will you do that this week? Amen. Amen. Are you excited? Woo! Now, just to let you know, we have a, a group, a, 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 this here where we're joining right now, this is about a little over 900 square feet. We're about 65 people. Now, just think, 900 square feet, if we went into a building that's 15,000, square feet are you able to serve yes. are you able? we're talking at building 15,000 square feet we're looking at at least 20 doors if there's 20 doors are you willing to stand at a door and serve and welcome the people that are coming in because that's what we're going to be asking you just to stand at a door and welcome people that are coming in you don't even have to go get them God's going to bring them in but you need to be standing at the door I'm walking them in with a big smile and say, you're welcome here. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Be blessed. Jesus. 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 want to speak in the name of the Lord this morning and um, you know I was in prayer this morning and I I felt um, God speak to uh, Linda Malay and so Linda if I could just ask you to stand if you don't mind in the name of Jesus could we just agree this is this is Jesus and um, he 
wants to speak to and minister to us as people, as church this morning. And um, you know, I know that uh, uh, Linda has been um, dealing with some health issues. And um, this morning as we were in prayer, I felt the Holy One say to her, he said, Linda, in the realm of the spirit, you're called the healed. In the realm of this spirit this morning, the Lord would say unto you that he calls you the healed. He calls you the healed of the Lord and the blessed of the Lord, God Almighty. Amen. Could you just j join with me as we echo that over, Linda? Stretch your hands out, please, this morning. And we're, we're speaking what is covenantially promised this morning, that by his stripes, amen, how many know by his stripes, we're healed. Amen. Speak it out with me. Call Linda the healed. Say, Linda, you're the healed. In the name of Jesus. Come on, call it out. Say, Linda, you are the healed. You are the healed of the Lord. Come on, congregation, speak it out. If one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. Imagine what all the voices of the house of God could speak over this woman of God and say, Woman of God, in the name of Jesus, we call you the healed. From the top of her head to the tips of her toes, we call you the healed. We call you the restored. We call you the delivered and set free. We call you the a bountiful basket overflowing with the goodness of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. One more detail this morning, amen. You ought to be in the prayer room in the mornings. It's awesome. Amen. I want to speak to you, Martin. I want to speak to you, Martin, in the name of the Lord God Almighty in whom you serve. The Lord would speak to you this morning and say the burden that you have for your nation, the burden that you carry on your heart for the people of Iran. The Lord said that those, that burden, though it be great, is not in, in proportion to the burden that the Lord God Almighty carries for that nation, Iran. You know, in the Bible, in this biblical days, the nation of Iran was a great nation under God. It was a great nation under God. Prophets of old, like Daniel, prophesied in Persia. He prophesied to the nations. And the nations turned to God during that realm when, when Daniel rose to be in leadership over the nation. How many know God is a God who restores? God is a, is a God who said, I will restore the years that the, that the canker worm have eaten and the palmer worm have taken away. How many know he's a God of restoration over Iran? Hallelujah. Join with me as we pray. And Martin, God says that he carries the burden of Iran. He wants you to know that. He carries the burden of Iran. And God is speaking over that nation and the principalities that have tried to rule it. And they are about to fall. They are about to bow their knees to the one who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Do we agree on that together? Can we agree today that Jesus is Lord over Iran? So we pray, Father, I pray for Martin, I pray for the people of, of Iran. I pray for those this morning, Father, that are putting their bodies on the front lines to protest in the natural, what that really is happening in the spiritual. They want freedom in that nation. They want a freedom that a human government really can't commit to. A freedom that Jesus the King of kings and the Lord of lords has spoken over all peoples to be free in the name of Jesus. Father, let that which is in the spiritual, let that which is true in the spirit be true in the lives in the natural of the people of Iran. We speak to Iran and we say, Iran, be free in the name of Jesus. In the name of Yahshua, we command freedom over that nation.
expecting a touch, a miracle, and a breakthrough from God. I want you just to stand right where you're at right now. Maybe you're already standing, but if you've been, if you've been believing in your heart, you say, you know what, I'm really expecting something incredible. I'm expecting a breakthrough. I'm really expecting. I'm really believing. I'm really standing here this morning, not only in the natural, but in my heart. I'm standing and I'm believing. Speak it over you now. Jesus. Jesus. Covenantal promise. Jesus. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, team. Wonderful. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if, uh, if some of you had opportunity yet. Perhaps later uh, today you'll see I put a post up on our, uh, on our Facebook page. It, um, it was the... Um, unity prayer that we have been prayed, praying over the house for many years and, uh, and it was narrated by, uh, by Neil Cameron and uh, anyway and uh, Gerard uh, had done it up for us uh, many years ago he did up this little video clip with the unity prayer being narrated by um, again by Neil Cameron 
And um, anyway, it was a little bit of a whimsical thing, uh, of course, because I saw people, you know, the video was made back in 2013. And so I, I saw people um, who were no longer uh, with us, uh, either they're no longer with us as a congregation, which is fine, we bless them. And then there's those who are no longer with us because uh, they've gone to be with the Lord. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the prayer lives on. And how many know that's the, that's the, um, the outflow um, even of the writer of the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 11? Um, he said, you know, that um, the things that they believed, the things that they proclaimed uh, and declared in their generation, uh, even though they're not here, how many know the, the prayer and the word is still at work? Amen? Amen. And do you know the word is still at work on your, on your behalf? Amen. Uh, many times the Lord can speak to you in, in one season and, uh, and you don't see it manifest. And for some you know, we, we think God maybe has forgotten or maybe I messed up and uh, I've missed it. But I'll tell you what, the word of the Lord is still active and energized and still working on your behalf. Amen. And, um, and so you are well within your spiritual rights to stand upon the word of God. Can you say amen? amen. And, uh, and so anyway, I just wanted to uh, uh, encourage those of you uh, who uh, prayed those prayers with us over these many years, this unity prayer, um, God is still watching over his word to perform it. Amen. So I wanted to, uh, to continue this morning uh, on the uh, spirit of Elijah. Now we could go on and on about it because really it is it's such a deep subject uh, that there's no way that it could be, um, com you know, really... Um, uh, even properly shared on a brief Sunday morning time frame. And, and perhaps some of it per, is, is not as profitable for, for everyone. Um, but I did, um, I did want to finish up that today. So if you'll give me a, a bit of time here just to reminisce or um, go over what we've already talked about. Um, but the spirit of Elijah is, a, uh, as we've talked about, is, is, is an anointing. It's, it's an anointing, and they call this, we call it the spirit of Elijah, but really what he's inferring is the anointing that was on Elijah for a purpose transcends the man. How many know it's not by power, it's not by might, it's by the spirit? Can you say it's by the spirit? And, um, and so this, when you talk about the spirit of Elijah, we're not talking about uh, some regurgitation uh, of, uh, or, uh, of a man, we're talking about the anointing and the calling and the purpose that was on the man and uh, is now transcends into different generations for the same purpose. Amen? Amen? And so we see that both on Elijah and in the New Testament settings, we see it also on John the Baptist and the uh, you know, and the purpose was one and the same. It was really to prepare God's people uh, for what was about to come. And I'll clarify a little bit more as we go along there. But they both came with this very common uh, goal. And it's the same anointing, of course, that's on the church today. And that is that they came both as a witness and how many know God always has a witness on earth? Amen? Amen. Uh, the, the writer of, um, of 1 John, of course, which was John, he, he decreed over his people at that time and now echoes through the generations to this people now here today. And he said, that which we have seen, right? That which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which we even touch with our own hands. We are now communicating to you. How many know that's what a witness is? How many are witness for the Lord? See, you are a witness for the Lord every time you have opportunity to share a bit of your testimony. And a little bit later, I'll exhort you, share your testimony as often as you can. 
Now, you might not be able to share your whole life story with somebody, but share a portion of what the Lord has done. How many know the Lord has done great things in you? Come on, what? The Lord has done great things in you, and He's not finished. But share your testimony, because that is a witness to this generation as the movie goes on, uh, God's not dead. He is fully alive. Amen. And so share your testimony. But they both came in their generation, Elijah and John. They came as a witness to bear witness of the reality of the person of God, but also of the plan of God. And, uh, and so anyway, that's what we want to talk about this morning. And uh, they're our testimonies, of course, are powerful, and we should take every opportunity to share them. Amen. So just to go over, Elijah's name, like the anointing that he carried, uh, his name meant, Jehovah is my God. Jehovah is my God. That's what the name Elijah means. Jehovah is my God. And that wasn't only his name, but that was his testimony. That was his witness. How many know the world needs to see that God is alive? Amen. And he's alive in you, amen, amen, who believe. And that's why I say that the anointing of Elijah, not the person of Elijah in what we're talking about, but the anointing, say the anointing of Elijah is on you. And it's to bear witness of God. His name meant Jehovah is my God. And how many know the Lord is wanting to encourage you? He wants to encourage you with that word, that truth so that you might live not as you, but you might live as a people who know their God and are, doing, are waxing eloquently and doing great signs and wonders. Amen. Amen. God wants to demonstrate to the world around us, to our family, to our friends, and to the whomsoevers, that God is God. And He's God in you. Amen. And so that means that we attempt great things for God. Amen? Yes. And we let God be God. Can you say amen? amen? See, that's what he wants to show. And I always feel a conviction because I'm kind of a bit more laid back in my personality. But the Lord says, you know, get your personality out of the way. He said, I want to show the world who I am. And, and we're the light. Amen. amen. We're the light in a dark world. People need to see God. Amen. Right? I mean, I mean, God, it's great to sing like we sing hymns and we see this and we say that. But you know what? It's not enough in the day we're living in. The Word says that this is gross darkness shall cover the earth. They need a bright light to shine. Amen. You see, under the spirit of Elijah, when Elijah confronted the false prophets and the people who were backslidden away from God, People who forgot who great, how great God was. A people that should have known better had forgotten that He is not just a God that, that we speak one day a week. He's the God that we live every moment of our lives. He's all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing. And so Elijah confronted that on, with the people. He made the... I tell you, he, he made the scales drop from their eyes. Many times during a time of fasting and praying as we're seeking the Lord. That's what happens. We remember. We say, oh my goodness. What am I doing? How have I slipped to be content with living a life of just being ordinary when the spirit of life that is in me is calling me upward, not to live ordinary, but to live extraordinary. Amen. So when I shout, does that freak you out? <laughs> what I'm saying is, is God in us 
the hope of glory. We just want to open up that possibility in our lives and remember, God hasn't called you to be ordinary. He's called you in Christ to be extraordinary. Turn to someone and says, you know what? You are extraordinary. So Elijah and John came to be a witness. We read about John in the opening verses of John chapter 1, verse 7. And I know I'm kind of reminiscing. I'm going over ground we've already tilled, but I felt we needed to irrigate that land or prepare that land a bit more. It says in John chapter 1, verse 7, it says, This man, talking about John, he came for a, a witness. Is it behind me? Okay, good. <laughs> I, I always send it to Solange last minute and pray to God that she's at time to do it for me. But it says, This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. You know, you've heard the, the old saying, it says if people won't read their Bible, live in such a way that they can see the Bible being lived through you. Amen? Let, let them read the scriptures through you, through your faith. And through your obedience as you walk through life. If they don't read the Bible, let them read you and see the Bible. Amen? That's good. Join John, it says in verse 29 of John chapter 129. It says that even while John was uh, doing all the baptism and he was the, he, he was the, he was the poster boy of that, of that hour. Like everybody was talking about this man who came out of the wilderness dressed in camel clothing and, and eating insects. They were all talking about him. And he was gaining fame because it says that uh, whole towns were coming out to be baptized by him at the River Jordan. But you know what? John didn't come. He, John wasn't chosen and called to glorify himself. How many know he was sent to prepare the way to glorify Jesus? Amen? How many know he was called to glorify Jesus? That, that's why I, I mentioned here, I put a little bit of a, a commercial inference here. But this, in this hour, it's not about the, the guy on TV or the guy in the pulpit. It's not about that at all. We're just the same as you all. We're all just vessels for the Lord to use. I believe that the last, the last chapter of the church is all about the church. It's all about the people of God beginning to rise up in their place and their callings and begin to walk under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You see, John said this later. He said, um, uh, well, let me finish this scripture. John 129, in the midst of all his popularity at that moment, of that recognition that he was getting from people, John pointed out Jesus. He, he saw Jesus in the crowd, right? I mean, he could have he tried to hang on to the glory himself, right? I mean, he had the people's attention. They were, every household would be talking at that time. They'd be talking about this, this, this John the Baptist that's down by the river Jordan who's confronting religious spirits and calling people to repent. I mean, they, you know what? He could have hung on that uh, in that spotlight, but he didn't. He saw the Lamb of God in whom he was called to bear witness to, and he pointed him out to the people, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. What? Well, come on. Behold the Lamb of God. Amen. And, and you know what? In that similitude, we are called not to bring glory to ourselves, but to always, we get, the atten we get some attention because people need to see us in order for us to point to Him. But, but that's the purpose of it, right? It, it's not about them people, people looking at you for the sake of you. The early apostles said, don't look at us, we're just men like you. 
We're just functioning and operating on the power of God, but it's, it's not us, it's Him. Amen. Can somebody shout out and say, it's Him. Yeah. See, we need to recognize Him. We don't want to deify or glorify a man or a woman. Him. It's Him. It's Him. Now, just at a bit of a, uh, again, a side note on that. Do you know that, that John, in the natural, under Judean law and custom, John himself would have been, because of his father, Zechariah, John would have been anointed to be a priest. He would have been anointed to be a priest. And only a priest could actually point out the sacrificial lamb. See, when John was pointing out Jesus, he was pointing it out under the unction of the Spirit, but he was also in his office as a priest. He was the one who could, who could pick out the sacrificial lamb that was without spot or wrinkle. See, so when he pointed out to Jesus, to the people of that day, they would have saw it twofold. That he was pointing out the Savior. But there's the people of that day that recognized him as a priest. Under the Le Levitical setting, they also recognized that John had the power as a priest to pick out the sacrificial lamb. Isn't that good? I mean, God left nothing. No stone unturned. So anyway, but he said this. He said he pointed out Jesus as the Lamb of God. And then later, this, this is so in our humanity. This will stretch you. It really will. Every one of us will be stretched in this area. If you haven't been, you will be. Amen. Listen up. This is good. I find... That it's glorious when the light is on you. But what happens when the light moves from you? I'm talking about this, the, the light of popularity. Yeah. The spotlight of recognition. Whether it's in the church. Whether it's in your workplace. No matter where it might be. What happens when the light of people's attention starts to move from you? and move to where it should be on him. See, I love John. His response was this. When the people around John tried to keep him in the spotlight, and he said, that's not what I came for. Hear me now. Because we're all flesh. And all flesh is the same. John said this to those who wanted to, to keep him, so to speak, um, in the spotlight. He said, he must increase and I must decrease. How many know there's only one, there's only one person who deserves to be in the spotlight? Say his name. Jesus. That's it. That's it. Only one. Yeah. Say his name again. Jesus. There's only one name the Father has given whereby a man might be saved. Amen. How many know if they know if they know your name, if they know my name, that's wonderful. That's great for introduction's sake. But I'm telling you what, Steve McLean can't save anybody. And neither can you. But we can point to the one who, do, who can. How many know there's only one name? Yeah, only one name. Say it with me again. Jesus. So last Sunday, I mentioned about the spirit of Elijah that was seen in operation through the Bible. And at least from what I have been taught, and, and uh, it may be more, but what I have been taught that there's five uh, separate dispensations, if you will, of that spirit of Elijah as we read through the pages of the Bible. And one, of course, is obvious. 
it's Elijah himself, right? And um, as we read in, about Elijah himself, and the other woman is, of course, is the one who, who came to carry um, the, the lamp, so to speak, or the light uh, beyond Elijah. Because remember, Elijah had a bit of a breakdown and, uh, because he was a man. And he couldn't finish that particular race, so God put another man in his place, and his name was Elisha. And, uh, and, and Elisha carried also the spirit of Elijah. As a matter of fact, remember, he asked Elijah not just for the, for the same measure of the anointing that was on him. He asked for a double portion. So that was the second um, time that we, we see in, 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 the, in biblical writing about the spirit of Elijah. And Elijah, Elisha continued in the same vein as Elijah. He came to bear witness. He came to show forth the power and the glory of God. Remember that Elisha actually performed twice the amount of miracles that Elijah did. Amen? And I mean, no, miracles, if you need a miracle, a miracle is good. Say it's good. But the miracle is also not just for, for, for you to meet your need, but it's also for God to be glorified. Amen. How many know when something happens that no man could do, uh, people take note of that? <laughs> Amen. Don't they? Yeah. Right. I mean, when a healing comes to someone and there, there, there's no other, there was no other method. And as a matter, so the doctors didn't treat you and, and, and God bless for the doctors. Amen. Amen. And, um, but it wasn't just because the doctors were treating you, even if they were treating you under the anointing and the wisdom of God. But when, a, when, when God heals somebody, of something that there is no other evidence, or another, no other way that that person could be healed other than a miracle. How many know God gets the glory? Amen. And, and so anyway, Elisha, he continued in that same anointing. So that was two. The, the third one, of course, as we said, it was uh, Elijah, which in Luke 1, 17, it says that he, that he carried on in the spirit and the power of Elijah, or the power and the spirit of Elijah. So that's three. Say three. three. And, uh, and, you know, and, it, and of course, uh, with John the Baptist, it was prophesied of him that under his particular flow within the spirit of Elijah, it was to turn the hearts of the children back to the Lord. Because as a nation, they had backslidden. The first Elijah, when he, when he confronted that on Mount Carmel, is, is because the nation had backslidden. They had backslidden so much with people who were educated and should have known better, but were people. They actually were beginning to worship idols. Not realizing perhaps what they had done, but that's the way the enemy works. You see, he slowly begins to uh, cloud our judgment and eventually blind our eyes. And uh, before we know, people are doing things that they shouldn't do, and they're not bothered by it. And so that's why the Lord sends the spirit of Elijah. He says, my goodness, it's wake-up time. It's wake-up time. And so he sends the spirit of Elijah. Woke a whole nation, came back to God, because a man or a woman of God stood under the spirit of Elijah, confronted the spirit realm, first of all, took authority in the spirit realm. Amen. And you know, you know, we go through times of prayer and fasting where we, you know, we're open for the Lord to correct us. We say, Lord, if we've done, if we're, if we've, you know, if we slid off the cracker a bit, get us back on board with it. Because you can't confront a spiritual, a principality that you yourself have kind of given place to. Amen. And so anyway, there's a bit of a dealing on our part. We prepare our own hearts because we say, Lord, if I become a bit this way, I can't confront it. Thank you. So John the Baptist was at number three. And then number four, in regards to being a witness, because remember this, this Elijah's anointing, its primary is to be a witness, to be a light in a dark time. And number four was when, the, when Jesus had taken some of his disciples up on a mount called the Mount of Transfiguration, which is Mount Hermon. You want to do a word search on Mount Hermon and realize how important that even that placement was that the Lord led them to? 
Mount Hermon, the place in Psalm 133, that the Lord has said this is a place uh, where God will command his blessing. He said, uh, you know, that place of commanded blessing. He said, it's like the dew that runs down from Mount Hermon. Anyway, I'm sorry, I love studying the Bible like that. But I know that sometimes I go on with it and and, uh, it just bores people out of their gourd. But I'm telling you that what he did when he led them up to Mount Transfiguration, he led them up Mount Hermon. And there on the mountain, it says that who appeared to him. How how many can guess who who appeared? Elijah. Elijah and Moses. And you know why? Because they are the power of the two witnesses that you'll read again about in Revelations chapter 11. Not, the, not so much the men, as, uh, but the, 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 the anointing, the governance that's, that, uh, that flowed out of that anointing. Anyway, if you put them all, that, all that together, these witnesses, there's five of them. Five times throughout the biblical history that we have a witness of the spirit of Elijah on the earth for the, for the, uh, for the, uh, the purpose of being a witness. On the Mount of Transfiguration, it was a witness to Jesus' own disciples to remind them the witness that Jesus came as a, as a um, 100% fulfillment of every Bible prophecy that was ever spoken about his return. He fulfilled every, so Elijah, he appeared as a, as a witness that Jesus came and he perfectly fulfilled the law and the prophets. It was a witness. And, and you know, the, the last one, as I said, is Revelation chapter 11. That will happen in the end times so that Israel, too, who's been waiting for the return of a Savior that's already came, and those two anointings will, will converge upon Israel in the last days to be a witness to the Jewish people and to the world that the Savior is not coming again as a Savior. He's coming as a King. And let the earth prepare Him room. See, five times the Spirit of the Lord began to intersect in human, in human history. To stop a people whose hearts have grown weary, whose hearts have grown uh, callous perhaps, whose hearts have become a bit lukewarm. And they needed the intervention of heaven again to begin to stir up the hearts of his people, to begin to stir them up and call them, wake up ye sleepers, arise from the dead ye. You know, that's what the spirit of Elijah does. I mean, no, we need the spirit of Elijah on the earth today. See, that's why we're praying for the backslider because we know that the Lord is stirring their hearts before his return. Can you say amen? I read this, um, this article, and, and you, you know, perhaps you've read a different one, and so your number would be different. But, you know, I read this article that says that Jesus himself fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies of his return. Can you imagine? Talking not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, saith God. I mean, oh, God is faithful. Yeah, how are we doing? I mean, it might be the grace of God for me that I can't see any time, so. <laughs> I guess if we get to a point where your stomachs are growling harder than louder than my preaching, then I'll know it's time to stop. So in a more localized way for the witness, as I say, that it's, we're, we're to be the witness now. We're to be a witness on earth. We're to be a witness in our job site. We're to be a witness in our homes for our children and for our families. We're to be a witness that God loves them and God is alive and God is coming back for them. We're to be a witness to remind them, you know, and, and sometimes if you can't get through this, this way anymore, go through this way. I want to tell you, my, my pastor, 
that I had a number of years ago. As a management consultant, he had been a he, he could have chose a career as a professional soccer coach, but he gets saved as part of a an Oak Shore from the Hickory um, revival meetings that were taking place in Scotland. And he came to Canada. He came to Canada with his wife Mary and two small children. They landed in Toronto. They had not one contact in Canada other than the Spirit of Grace calling him to come. He said, I landed in Toronto. And he said, I have no idea which way to go. I had no idea why we were here. I only was aware that I had two small children to care for. But I had a calling to carry. So he ends up out in Alberta, and we became part of his church later on. He told me as he was nearing toward the end of his ministry. And he said, you know what, Stephen? He said, if I've learned one thing over this last decade of many decades of serving God. He said, I wish I would have spent more time on my knees. He said, if I would have spent more time on my knees and less time on my feet running around trying to, um, you know, keep the flock together and so forth. He said, if I would have spent more time on my knees and less time on my feet, he said, we would be further along than we are today. He said, I'll bear that, that the Lord would give grace and forgive me for my error. But I, I remember that. Wish I would have practiced it. But anyway, <laughs> you know, the Elijah anointing is, um, I read this book many years ago. Some of you may have read it. If not, it's, it's, it's a good read, a little heavy. But it's called The Elijah Task. It was written by a, a man named John Sanford. And, um, and he talks a lot about what this anointing is all about. And if you'll just bear with me for a few minutes, I'll try to hasten my steps. Did I mention again, um, because I know Mark, my friend Mark Stewart, he, he would love me to say this again. But do you remember that when I said that there's five mentions in the, New Te- in the Bible about the interaction of the spirit of Elijah uh, on the earth? And five represents the number of grace. And it's the grace of God that comes to us, amen, and leads us to repentance. It's the goodness of God. I'm telling you, if we could repent on our own, if my own willpower could bring me through to repentance, oh, that'd be something. But the truth of it is, it's by the grace of God. And so when the Lord begins to stir our hearts towards something, towards some kind of a, of a change, you know, trying to do that on your own strength will not get you very far. Even if you get a measure of success, it oftentimes what happens because we think that we're the driver behind it, we become religious. When the Lord begins to deal with something in your heart, you don't need to hide it. You don't need to be ashamed of it. But don't try to fix it on your own. Go to God. Know the reason why you're being stirred about it is because God wants to deal with it. You've got to appreciate the heart of David. David, the man after God's own heart. He, he said this to the Lord in a prayer. He said, Lord, know my heart. Know me. What? I mean, just open up my heart wide. Perfectly naked before the Lord. And he said, know my heart and see if there be any wicked way within me. Because I can't read that on my own. The heart is deceitfully wicked. It won't tell you that something's wrong. But the Spirit of grace will. And if the Lord speaks it, it's because He wants to heal, to seal, or deliver. Amen? Amen. So, uh, John Sanford wrote this book. And, um, and here's what you can see it in the, in the lives of these two men, John and, and Elijah, that they both seem to come out of obscurity. There's nothing written about Elijah. You know, beyond the first introduction of his, of his ministry and his calling in 1 Kings chapter 17. There's not much. There's nothing written. I mean, you could, it might be a subjecture that this could be Elijah prior to that day. But it's on that day that all of a sudden you got this great man of God. Right? I mean, he's moving in the signs and wonders. His preaching is bold. His sermons are innovative. And all of a sudden, he just comes out of obscurity. What about John the Baptist? I mean, sure, we knew him when he was a baby and a child. But what was he doing for 30-some years in the wilderness? Mm -hmm. Right? He seemed to come out of obscurity. 
I'll tell you what they were doing. What we know what they were doing is in the spirit of, the, uh, of intercession and prayer, they were in the wilderness preparing ye the way of the Lord. See, there was a great preparation in the spirit realm before there was ever a great move on the human, human level. And many times we fail to pay the price in prayer and we expect to see great things in life. See, they were preparing the way of the Lord long before they began to step into their ministry, which was very short in duration compared to the, the time frame that they spent preparing the way. In John Sanford's book, he says this about the spirit of Elijah in John's life. He said, you know what? The spirit of Elijah in your life is similar to an iceberg. You know, an, an iceberg, really the greatest mass of an iceberg is under the surface and not seen by man. Only a small portion of an iceberg is on above the surface. How many know only a small portion of your calling and ministry will ever be seen by anybody on the surface? If you want to be powerful in public life, then you need to be intentional in your private life. Jesus said, if you, if you go into your prayer room, close the door, and spend that time with God, if you really want to know what God's doing, go in the prayer room, close the door, shut off your media, and listen to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Not what the Spirit of man is saying, even though it might be good. But you know, hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And then what the Spirit of man would say to you around would only confirm to you. Amen? Amen. It says in Elijah, or uh, James chapter 5, 17, it says that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly, or fervently, some translations say, that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. You know what it's saying there? is there's an anointing that was on Elijah. But again, Elijah was just a man. Hang with me for a moment because I'm not talking about your gender. I'm talking about our species. You're just a man. You're just human. And I don't mean just human because you're, you're so special even as a human that God sent His Son to die for you, that God Himself became man. So you're pretty, you're pretty awesome. You know what? You're all together. We're pretty, we're pretty incredulous um, that God would think you to be so special that he himself would take on your form in order to come and die on a cruel cross and bear our sins so we could become like him again. But what I'm saying that in our human form, just hang with me for a few more minutes. This is my last Sunday to preach on this. And, uh, and so I want to get this out to you. You're just a man. And, uh, and Elijah, in just being a man, had a breakdown. Elijah, as a man, became so depressed. Yes, he suffered depression. He suffered depression uh, more than most of us will ever, uh, uh, thankfully, become uh, in touch with. He became uh, so depressed that he just wanted to die. He was even telling the Almighty, he said, leave me alone, I just want to die. How many know that was his humanity speaking? John the Baptist later when he was in prison, the same John the Baptist that pointed out the Son of God, the same John the Baptist that called uh, people, thousands and thousands of people to come and get right with God, this same John the Baptist in prison began to doubt whether he even believed in Jesus. Right? Are you the one? Or should I be looking for somebody else? What? But you see, that is humanity. How many know you're human? Okay, some of you don't believe that. Give yourself a really hard pinch. Come on, give yourself a really hard pinch and then tell me you're not human. <laughs> what I'm saying about that is this, is that you know what? We're all human. None of us are perfect. Come on. But just because you yourself... Think yourself not to be perfect does not mean you can't be powerful. 
It's God in you, the hope of glory. God doesn't want your, your, your mindset that you are not perfect to stop you from rising up in that hour and allowing God to be powerful. Amen. That's why we must prepare. You know what I've been hearing in my spirit? This is me. Is the Lord said, not only do I want to revive you, He said, I want to revive the work. That's what Habakkuk. Remember Habakkuk in chapter uh, 1 and 2 and leading in, he was complaining, he was hurt, he was discouraged, just like Elijah. He went, you know what I mean? He was almost given up on believing God. But when God corrected him and says, you know what, even though the vision tarries, wait for it, it's going to come to pass. I'm telling you, church, it's going to come to pass. Because it's the word of the Lord. And he said, though it tarries, wait for it. Don't get discouraged. Do not grow weary in well-doing. For in due time you shall reap the harvest as long as you don't faint. The Lord is watching over His Word to perform it. You've got prayers unanswered. You've got words not yet fulfilled. You've got miracles believed for that hasn't yet happened. Don't grow weary in well-doing. For in due time you shall reap the harvest as long as you don't give up. Amen. Amen. I know Tim and I have talked over the years and we said, you know what, we don't want to grow weary in well-doing because we have a whole field here, spiritual field in Moncton that we've sowed seeds in for, well, for us for 25 years and them guys longer than that. He said, I don't want somebody else to be reaping my harvest. <laughs> so Habakkuk said, why must I be prepared? Let me quickly end this. Why must I prepare? Because Habakkuk said this in chapter 3, uh, verse 2. He said, Lord, I've heard your speech, and I was afraid. Oh, Lord, revive your work. Come on. Revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. You know that faith worships. Faith worships, but it also works. Amen. That's what we were praying this morning. Tim was praying this morning. Let there be an activation. Yes. Let those who have allowed themselves, their hands to grow uh, weary and idle, may they ask once more, Lord, revive the work. He will bless the works of your hands. Faith worships, but it also works. We see that Hebrews eleven seven anyway, by faith Noah, divinely being warned, I hope that's our case, of things not yet seen, was moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. See, faith prepares. You have a promise? Are you preparing for it? Faith prepares. Noah prepared the ark for the saving of his household. We are preparing this next juncture of uh, Moncton Victory Church because we believe what was spoken in the valley is shouted from the mountains. We believe that what was spoken in the dark will be revealed in the light. We believe that when the, when the task is too big for human hands, we are in a great place because now it's in God's. Do you know that this too, a Barna report, I was listening, I couldn't sleep a few nights ago, and uh, I was watching um, John Bevere, he's introducing, anybody hear John Bevere? He's, he's introducing a new book, it's called the, um, the Awe of God. And he said one of the reasons why he embarked on writing this new book, it took him a whole year to write it, he said it's because I feel that the church has lost its awe of God. He said, I, I feel that over the last few decades, we've been so committed to preaching about the love of God yes. and the grace of God. 
that we forgot to bookend that with the fear of God. And he said, and people, uh, multiple people who've come and given their lives to Christ have come to, uh, to a loving God, but have forgotten that this loving God wants them to repent and surrender their lives fully to him and not have one foot in and one foot out. He said, I'm, I'm concerned that we've forgotten the fear of God. And when you forget the fear of God, he said, it's the beginning of wisdom. So the Barnard Group says this several, over the last few decades that um, now John Bevere, I, uh, we, Sherry's a fact checker. She fact checks. I'm telling you what, she fast check, fact checks me right to the wall. Oh! You know what she said? She said in the United States through the whole COVID era mm -hmm. and beyond mm -hmm. that over 40 million 40 million Americans have left the faith wow. and became agnostics or even atheists. Wow. One of the key worship leaders with the Hill Songs that wrote, wrote songs that we sing in church, one of the key leaders is now a confirmed atheist. I'll tell you, the thing of it is, is that people don't recognize. They've got, to keep their, they've got to keep their faith alive. They need to keep their, uh, their spirit man alive. They need to continue to keep themselves in the faith. Amen? Because these are challenging days. Amen? So that's what we're believing for. We're not believing for that, by the way. We're believing for those who've been caught up in that to once more be stirred by the Spirit of the Lord and return. Isaiah 60, verse 1, and with this I close, if you can believe that. No, it's true. Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60. Let me, let me, just, let me just speak it over you. Isaiah 60, verse 1. I'm telling you, God loves us. What? Can I hear an echo? God loves you with an everlasting love. God loves your family. God loves your children. God loves your neighbors. God doesn't want any man to perish, but all to come re to repentance. How many know the spirit of Elijah was all about grace? It was all about God intervening on the behalf of mankind to make sure that we don't slip so far from God that we became like the angels who fell. God is calling his people to once more to return to the Lord, all ye saints. Return to the Lord. Isaiah 60 is kind of the culmination of that. Isaiah 60 says this, and by the way, this is a command, not a suggestion. He said, arise and shine, for your light has come. Remember we talked about the light not only being Jesus, but it's your witness of Jesus. Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon he says, gross darkness will cover the earth, but it will not come nigh you. Can you turn up and say, God, it will not come nigh me because you are for me, not against me. God, you are here to intervene on my behalf. God, you are here to intervene on behalf of my children and my children's children. Can you stand with me this morning in faith? Can you stand before me and before God in conviction that the work that he started, he will also complete? You grew weary in prayer. <laughs> Listen, I want to tell you. There was a man in the early part of the 20th century during the Second World War. His name was, his name was Praying Hyde. He was taken as an older man at that time. He was taken to the doctor because he had health concerns. And some of his uh, men, young men who ministered with him were concerned for him. And when he went to the doctor, the doctor said, this is a, a terrible tragedy, but this man's heart is not where it, it should be in his body. It's actually shifting to the opposite side of his chest. This man needs immediate bed rest. 
ran high with such an intercessor. He passionately pleaded for the people of Scotland and the people of that hour. He prayed with such intensity and with such power that his little heart moved in his chest. You know, I was saying about the great evangelist John Wesley. As John Wesley, in the early part of the 19th century, preached the gospel all through the, the Midwest, and thousands and thousands of people came to Jesus because of John Wesley's evangelistic ministry. But you know, it's said about John Wesley that weeks before John Wesley would arrive in a town to do a crusade, a lone monk would come into town quietly with no financial backing, oftentimes not even having a bed to sleep on, nor food to eat. But he would come and he would labor in prayer for weeks before the crusade would come to town. And once the crusade started, he would slip off to the next town to do the same thing. John Wesley credited this man as being the main, the main energy behind the success of his prayer meeting or his evangelistic crusades. He would spend those times. I'm telling you, listen, no bed to sleep on. Sometimes no food to eat. No, no, no glory in front of man because man didn't even know he was in town. Knew less when he left town. But I'm telling you, in the glories, in the, chron in the chronicles of heaven, how many know it's written about this, this lone monk? And though he received no credit, no glory here on earth, how many know he will stand before the, the throne room of God and God will say to him, well done. Well done. Somebody's praying. I can feel it. Somebody's praying for me. Holy hands of angels move. My wife is a singer. You can tell. I listened to that little video we showed earlier. And some of the background that came behind it. The man who wrote it had been away from God. And when he came back to God and his eyes were open. It helped pen the words to that song. Somebody's praying. I can feel it. Somebody's praying for me. Holy hands of angels. Uh, I wish I could do it. But you know what I'm saying? Somebody was praying for you. Somebody was praying. Now it's our turn. Arise and shine for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Amen. Can you give God a big shout offering? That... Amen. I mean, can you give him, can you give him thanks Amen. for the moms, the grandmas, the granddads, the aunts, the uncles, the neighbors who were praying for you without you even realizing that kept you from harm? Mm -hmm. Maybe it kept you from death's door because mm -hmm. God had a purpose for your life. Mm -hmm. Somebody's praying. Mm -hmm. Hey, listen, as we're closing, bro, is it George? Is that your name, George? I can't remember your name. Or Roger, George, Roger. Roger. You know, somebody was praying for you, Roger. Somebody was praying for you. Somebody is still praying for you. But somebody was praying for you for such a time as this, that you might have came through everything you've come through in life, which I have no idea what it is. But I feel the Spirit of the Lord unction me to tell you that somebody was praying you through all those dark times during the times when you couldn't see but the Spirit of the Lord was giving somebody the ability to see on your behalf and to call those things that are not as though they are in your life. You see, somebody was praying. Somebody was praying for you, Ron. 
Somebody was praying. I want you to say that out again. Somebody was praying. Thank God that somebody was praying, right? We're not giving the glory to the man. We're giving the glory to God, right? We are wit- we're a witness. We're a witness that points out to God. Come on in this house. Can somebody say somebody was praying? Come on. I like a little, little enthusiasm this morning. Somebody was praying for me. Glory to God. Somebody was praying for me. Somebody was praying for me. Somebody was praying for you. That's right. You know, it's, listen now, it's hurtful to say this. Do you know, it is hurtful to say this. I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus, it is hurtful to say this. But as a young man of 15 years old, I crawled out of the back seat of a car at 3 a.m., stoned and drunk and everything else, as was my habit. Got out of that car at 3 a.m., uh, which is totally, uh, totally not the norm. We, usually, we stayed all night. We partied all day. We, we partied all night. And you know what? At 3 a.m., my friend stopped off in front of the house. He let me and my other friend, Michael, come, uh, get out of the car. And my other friend, who had been my friend all of my life, crawled into the very spot that I was sitting. And that night went to be wherever. He was asphyxiated in the exact same spot. You know, because somebody's praying. Somebody's praying. Somebody had an unction from the Holy Spirit that somehow this 15-year-old boy and you can put yourself in that same picture if you'd like. You don't know how many times God had to put it on somebody's heart to rescue you out of a near-death experience because God has a calling on you for such a time as this. Somebody's praying. Come on, what? Somebody's praying. Thank God somebody's praying. Somebody's praying. 